evening. My name is Sandra Fritz. I'm the chairperson of the Shoeshoe School Committee, and welcome to our meeting of June 10th. Tonight's virtual meeting is being broadcast live on Soho channels 29 and 329, and it will be streamed live on Shoeshoe Media Connections website. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Executive Director of SMC, Mark Sara, as well as the IT Director for Shoesbury, Brian LaRue, for helping us with each of these meetings. Tonight's meeting will be rebroadcast between now and our next regularly scheduled meeting on June 17th. The public participation portion of our meeting is suspended due to the fact this is a virtual meeting. However, the public can email any questions and comments to the school committee at schoolcommittee at shoesbury.k12.ma.us. First on the agenda is chairperson and members report. Does anybody have anything this evening? John? Yeah, thanks, Sandy. Um, I just want to thank uh, the leadership team at Shrewsbury High School for what was really a great week of graduation festivities. I know we've talked a lot about this over the last uh, month or so, but uh, yesterday we, we had our diploma ceremony. It's very well done. I also recognize that this is happening every day uh, for five days this week, 100 families per day. I know they just wrapped up, I think, day three. Uh, most of the uh, coordination involved. Most of the uh, the people involved with coordinating are not watching this right now because they're probably wrapping up. But to Todd, Maureen, PJ, Greg, Jeff, Jay Costin, everyone involved in uh, organizing and celebrating class of 2020, job well done uh, from award ceremonies to the parade to the speeches, uh, just to the in-person diploma presentations by families. It really feels, from my perspective, as a parent, uh, like we uh, received more than we would have under normal circumstances, right? And uh, just really special uh, time. Um, and I, I've always said this, and I really feel it now, having gone through it uh, with uh, my son. You know, just SHS is really a first class operation from my perspective. I've seen it uh, from many different perspectives, uh, but I just remember the excitement that I had when Jack was in eighth grade. Um, thinking about his entry in the high school, knowing all the great support that they have there. And it, it, it exceeded expectations for me. Um, and I appreciate them going above and beyond. Uh, it's very, very well done. Uh, so thank you. Great. Thanks, John. Anyone else? I see anything. I just like to mention that last night, the Beale Building Committee, um, Dr. Sawyer, myself, uh, Mr. Collins and the rest of the committee were able to go to the new Beal site and had a tour with our construction uh, crew with Fontaine Brothers as long as well as um, Lermo Pagano architects there as well. It was great to be out, great to see everyone and it's uh, coming along really well. It is on time, which is a great thing in light of some of the construction issues other um, building projects have had throughout the state. So. Nice to see it and um, great to uh, work with these Fontaine Brothers and LPA. It's just a really well-run organization. So it was interesting and wonderful to get out. So thank you. And next is uh, Superintendent's report. Thank you, Ms. Fritz. Uh, I, I would concur last night. It was very exciting to actually be able to walk inside the uh, structure as it's uh, constructed to date, um, shaping up to resemble the plan that you see on paper or in the architect's drawings and it is going to be a really wonderful school building facility for our students in the town for decades to come. Uh, we'll have a few pictures I'll, I'll share on social media when I have a chance, but uh, it really is a wonderful site for a school. And uh, I concur that uh, the team of uh, PMA consultants as our project manager, LPAA architects, Lerma Pagano uh, and Fontaine Brothers are doing a remarkably uh, excellent job. So thank you to all of them. Um, I also concur with Mr. Wenske. I was able to uh, be up at the high school uh, on Monday for uh, some of the diploma ceremonies and uh, they, they are truly, I think first class is a good descriptor. I know parents and, and uh, students, uh, our graduates in particular, are, are enjoying these and we're very happy we're able to make that work done in a very, uh, uh, just a classy way all around and looking forward to our families uh, tomorrow evening. I uh, also want to share, I also thank uh, our principals, assistant principals, secretarial staff, other support staff uh, who have been organizing uh, the return of our students' belongings. That's been happening over the past week and uh, will continue in the next week uh, at our various elementary, middle, and, and schools and high school next week. Uh, and although it sounds like something simple given all the restrictions we have um, and limited staff on site, that definitely has been a lot of logistical uh, challenges and I really appreciate all the hard work people did to make that run smoothly um, to help return things to our, our students and their families. Um, this is the last full week of remote learning. Uh, well, again, I want to sincerely thank all of our educators for their hard work uh, and the skill that they brought to this endeavor. 
Um, thank you for the support our parents have provided. And certainly I wanna thank our students for hanging in there during this very unexpected and challenging time over the last couple of months. Um, and then finally, uh, relative to the ongoing national uh, crisis relative to racism um, and how we're working to address this issue in our school district, uh, I did wanna let uh, the committee know and the public that we are in the beginning stages of setting up some conversations with recent alumni, uh, students, families, and staff, uh, particularly uh, to talk about this particular issue rather. Um, we wanna hear their perceptions, their questions, their concerns. Uh, we'll also be reviewing and have begun reviewing some high quality uh, opportunities for professional development for our staff. Um, and we uh, hope to receive the uh, equity audit report from the Aswood Valley Collaborative soon. Uh, we may be able to present something as soon as next week's school committee meeting with information of that report, uh, which will certainly uh, be a timely uh, piece of information at this point. Um, I know the school committee is going to be addressing this with their first agenda item, uh, but I wanted to let uh, the community know uh, that we're already uh, where we have the opportunity working uh, to, uh, to start to address these issues, which will be ongoing work, of course. Uh, and that is Superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Chair, if, if, if you might, I'm sorry, I missed, missed my opening before. I just wanted to do an extra um, shout out to uh, our PTOs. Uh, and in particular, I'm thinking about our patent PTO. Uh, this week organized a surprise goodbye parade for Wendy Bell, um, who we all know is moving on. And it was a wonderful event and a reminder yet again of all the parents and the work that they do, on not only educating their children, but now figuring out innovative ways to continue to kind of build community in this virtual space. And, it was, it was great to see um, Ms. Bell off in, a, in, a, in some sort of more proper fashion. And, uh, and I really appreciate all the work that they've been doing to figure out how to, how to continue to support our schools. So I wanted to, to thank them for all of that, that work. Thanks, Lindsay. Okay, first on the agenda tonight is the school committee resolution condemning racism. And I'm gonna turn this over to Mr. Palish as he spearheaded this effort for the school committee. Thank you, Mrs. Fritz. Colleagues, at our meeting last week, I mentioned my intention to bring forward a resolution in the wake of the killing of George Floyd, expressing the school committee's sentiments with regard to the murder and, and racism more broadly. Uh, and I noted at the time, and I'll reiterate now, my feeling that it is important for Shrewsbury Public Schools to speak up uh, in, in light of this incident and in light of the conversations that have taken place since. I, I commend again the superintendent for his statement last week. I feel it's important for the school committee to go on record here. You know, sometimes uh, people who are in political positions as the five of us are, make statements and the public perceives them as hollow. I think it's important for the school committee to weigh in on this situation because we have not only staff members of color, but we have families of color who send their children to be with Shrewsbury Public Schools for hours and hours a day. Uh, and there's a lot of fear, there's a lot of anger, uh, and those are certainly justified sentiments. Uh, and I think that people are looking towards Shrewsbury Public Schools where their kids spend time and they wanna know what we think and how we feel. Uh, and so to that end, I drafted a resolution that was included uh, with your meeting materials. Uh, that draft resolution largely remains intact uh, as a result of some feedback uh, I've received since and having some conversations. Uh, I have added to that resolution. So as opposed to moving that we adopt the resolution as printed, uh, I'm going to move that we adopt uh, a resolution that I will read aloud in its entirety. Uh, and that is in parts to encompass the additions that have been made since. Uh, that is also because I think it's important that the community hear this resolution aloud. For those of you who are looking along with the draft that was included with your materials, uh, just to see where there is new text. There was additional text at the end of the second bullet point. And there is an additional third bullet point added. So there's a short bullet point after the second that is new. Uh, so to that end, I hereby move that the Shrewsbury School Committee adopt the following resolution. The Shrewsbury School Committee hereby condemns the murder of George Floyd that took place in Minneapolis, Minnesota on May 25th, 2020, recognizes and condemns the ongoing impact of racism, both overt and structural, on Black Americans that continues in our nation. All individuals and organizations, including Shrewsbury Public Schools, have an obligation to recognize and work to remove attitudes and barriers that lead to inequitable treatment based on race. Recognizes that education is an important vehicle to address racism. We must better understand our history as it relates to racism and engage in critical conversations on the topic. 
recommits to the elements of our Shrewsbury Public Schools core values that our district honor each person's individuality, celebrate our community's diversity, and support school cultures of mutual acceptance and respect, and strives to create opportunities for all students to achieve success. And finally, commits to supporting the superintendent's announced intention that we will do better for our students, families, and staff members of color, and that a conscious and, a conscious and deliberate effort be made on that front. And I would be looking for a second. Second. Okay, it's been moved and second, but before we move forward with the vote, is there any, anybody have any comments before we go forward? Lindsay? I, I want to just uh, commend Mr. Palich for, for pushing this issue. I think, it's, I think it's the right move, and I think it's important that the community know that we stand behind the superintendent's efforts, um, and I really do appreciate in, in particular the addition that we know that education is one of the tools to combat racism, and we are a community now with many people on this screen committed to educating our, our youngsters and, um, and, and ultimately the community that we live in and, and we help to create that. Um, so whether it's talking about is issues of history that I've had many conversations with people where our, our history books at times have been muddled in across America, uh, where we need to really acknowledge our past and build up our ability to, to engage in important and meaningful dialogue and we serve an important role in, in doing that. So, I, I want to thank you, and I am in mm -hmm. certainly full support. Excellent. Thank you, Lindsay. Anyone else have any comment? I'm not seeing any. Again, thank you, Jason, for spearheading this, bringing it forward. Um, it's And as you and I talked about it, it isn't just words on paper. It's action, and that is something that our community and our schools have always done. And I, I have the full support of, you know, Dr. Soria and his staff knowing that this is something that we will continue to work at getting better at. So again, thank you, Jason, really appreciate it. So there's nothing further. May I have a roll call vote? Dale? Aye. Lindsay? Aye. John? Aye. Jason? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you again. And I will send a copy of the updated resolution to Mrs. McCollum, our clerk, for meeting materials. Excellent, thank, thank you. you. Okay, next we are going to have an update from Dr. Sawyer in district administration on the school district's response to COVID-19 school closure. Thank you, Ms. Fritz. I'm going to share my screen. And I think I need to pick the wrong one. Hold on one moment. You just give me a thumbs up that you can see that. Okay. So again, uh, we'll begin with the key messages that we've uh, been giving throughout this uh, time period that our health and well-being, of course, of our students, families, and staff is our first priority. That during this extraordinary time, uh, we believe it's everyone's responsibility in our community uh, to respond to this challenge. And that we've continued to support our students, families, and staff from a distance and with the main goal of empowering continued student learning. Uh, one thing, I, there's been a lot of questions, of course, and there's been some published reports uh, recently relative to the planning for reopening schools. Um, I want to make it clear to those watching this evening that despite some reports in the media, uh, the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education um, has not yet released guidelines for reopening schools next fall. Um, we have been planning for various contingencies here in Shrewsbury uh, based on some guidance and some signals uh, that the department has communicated. Uh, so far, they, they issued something last week around uh, the expected types of personal protective equipment or PPE uh, that would be expected of school districts, so districts could begin procuring those items. Um, they also issued just late on Sunday night uh, some programming uh, guidance around summer programming, um, and Ms. Belsito will speak to that in a bit. Uh, but the commissioner has indicated and he communicated yesterday with superintendents that despite some reports in the newspapers, uh, based on conjecture, based on that initial guidance provided um, in terms of guidance for the opening of next school year, uh, that will be coming sometime in the next uh, couple of weeks uh, from the state. Um, the commissioner has also indicated that it's expected to be pretty directive. Um, so although we've been planning for contingencies, uh, we also need to await uh, what the state is going to be requiring of us. Um, there are some potential scenarios, of course, based on what's happening in other countries, other states that have reopened schools. 
Um, I expect that various measures will be required to be in place. That could include the use of masks by students and staff, uh, the limitation of the numbers of students that could be present uh, in an entire school or in a, one classroom space at a time. Uh, we certainly need to be planning uh, for potential hybrid model uh, of in-person and remote learning, uh, particularly if we need to limit the numbers of students in school at one time, where there may be uh, time periods or you know, whether that's some kind of cycle where some portion of a, a week or during a week they would be in school um, and then alternatively learning from home in a remote setting. Uh, we also need to anticipate there could be interruptions. Um, if there was a resurgence of the virus, um, all of the in-person learning could again have to pivot very quickly um, to remote learning. Um, so all these are all things that we're reviewing uh, and making contingency plans for, um, and we are awaiting the state guidance uh, regarding these potential scenarios. Um, as we do that, I just want to emphasize there is great uncertainty right now, uh, both regarding what the public health regulations will be, how the phase reopening of the state evolves, how uh, hopefully the metrics continue to improve in our state. Um, and we also don't know yet what our financial resources will be uh, for next year because that budgetary information is not known. Um, so I do appreciate everyone's patience as we do everything we can to prepare, uh, but we await uh, key elements and, and key information to be able to plan effectively. At this point, I'll turn it over to Ms. Belsito, who will talk a bit about an update regarding extended school year services that, that take place during the summer um, for students uh, who have uh, the need due to their learning disabilities. Um, so Ms. Belsito. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Uh, we certainly recognize that summer programming is an essential time for some students to maintain skills, prevent regression, and to continue to engage in learning and social skills. Most recently, we received additional communication on the evening of June 7th from the Department of Education to review health and safety updates for how we might hold in-person instructional opportunities for students with disabilities in order to provide extended school year programming as specified in IEPs. The Special Education Administration has collaborated closely with our Director of Nursing, Noelle Freeman, and our Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, Patrick Collins, to ensure our students' health and well being remain a top priority during this crisis. Consideration is given to the nature and severity of a student's needs and the barriers they pose on a student's ability to access remote learning. Determination of in person instruction will be based on providing services to our most vulnerable learners who receive multiple services during the course of, ex of the year, who need more time to learn new skills to increase the success of re-entry to school in the fall. In addition to learning needs, we recognize that some families of the aforementioned students may have concerns about the safe and healthy of health of their children and may choose not to have them participate in person if we have that opportunity. Next slide. The guidance for in-person extended school year programming will be limited to half day programming. For those whom we can offer in-person programming, there may be additional supplemental remote learning opportunities. Given this guidance, students will be signed either AM or PM in-person sessions. Unfortunately, due to operations planning, we are unable to honor session requests. We understand the importance of students access to instruction and therefore all students summer programming this year whether in-person or remote, will be six weeks, July 6th through August 13th, Monday through Thursday. Due to all of these factors and more, we are just not able to offer in-person services without further compromising the health and safety of our students and staff. Therefore, remote services will begin on July 6th for all students who qualify for extended school year services. Following the guidance from the Department of Education, we will continue to be hopeful that we will be able to introduce in-person services for some portion of the summer for some of our students, but we are not able to confirm that at this very moment. We will keep in very close contact with our families as we proceed. We are kindly asking that parents take the time to provide input to their child's unique learning needs by completing an extended school year services survey that was sent out um, this afternoon to those qualified families in an email um, actually from myself. Your, the input will help guide our staffing and operations planning to ensure the, ensure the high quality programming that the Shrewsbury Public Schools demonstrates. And um, as you can see on this slide, 
Uh, we know that the extended school year services, whether it's remote or even in person, won't quite look like this photo that was um, from just last summer. And I chose to share this photo this evening as we honor one of our retirees and some staff that work within the program. Um, so here are some of our, our students from the ELC at Shrewsbury High School. And we sure do miss those smiles. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Belsito. Um, at this point, uh, I'd like to shift to an update regarding the next year's budget. Uh, Mr. Collins will uh, provide some information relative to financial and operational issues. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sawyer. So just a few updates uh, relative to development of uh, next fiscal year budget, fiscal 21. Um, last evening at the Board of Selectmen's uh, meeting, uh, they took a formal vote to adopt a so-called 1 12th uh, budget um, to cover the month of July 2020, which is the first month of the fiscal year. And this is uh, uh, an action that uh, many, if not most, of uh, the other municipalities in the state will be adopting as well. Uh, it allows a community to proceed with uh, spending uh, public monies without having a uh, formal or regular budget process having been completed. So it goes to the so-called default uh, 1 12th budget process. Uh, and that's uh, part of the statute that the law affords uh, the Board of Selectmen in a municipal district uh, to take that action and then submit that budget to uh, the Mass Department of Revenue on behalf of uh, all the municipal uh, departments, including and uh, including also the school department. Um, there are various amounts that have been allocated for uh, each of the municipal departments and school department. Uh, and the amount allocated for the school department for July is $5.5 million. Uh, that amount happens to represent uh, approximately 1 12th of our current year fiscal 20 budget. Next slide. Um, so what will this money be used for? Uh, this money uh, for what types of expenditures do we typically have in the month of July? Uh, so certainly we have expenditures related to funding uh, salaries and wages for our full year staff, which includes all of the central office uh, staff, administrators and support staff. Uh, also uh, secondary school, middle school and high school principals and uh, their full year staff as well. Uh, expenditures related to uh, the program Mrs. Belsita just talked about, which is our summer special education program uh, starting on July 6th. Uh, typically in July, uh, we are billed or invoiced uh, for uh, leasing payments, uh, part of uh, ongoing existing leasing payments for technology hardware. Um, and so those payments come due, we'll be able to uh, provide uh, payments for those. Uh, same, uh, kind of the same vein, uh, many of the software licensors, uh, licenses uh, are renewed during the month of July. And uh, so this funding will be able to provide payment for those as well, along with annual professional association membership dues, which are very important that we uh, retain membership uh, for our professional development activities, our networking activities uh, ongoing, and then just general office supplies, custodial supplies, and other miscellaneous items. Uh, so that's typically what would happen in the month of July. Just for context, um, and so that the school committee is kind of reassured about this funding level, typically for the last uh, three Julys, for the last three fiscal years, our total expenditures for the month of July have been in the range of a million to a million two. Um, and so we are uh, certain that this uh, maximum authorization, if you will, uh, up to 5.5 million will certainly suffice uh, for our expenditures. Uh, and even if we incur some other COVID related expenses. Um, but it is also extremely important uh, that, and we will of course uh, be extremely judicious in uh, making any expenditure for fiscal 21 because any dollars that we do spend will count towards the eventual fiscal 21 budget that gets approved by town meeting uh, which again, we hope is sometime in uh, late summer, uh, possibly early fall, but we're hoping for uh, late summer, maybe mid-August would uh, uh, 
might be the time frame if the state completes it, its budget process uh, sometime in July. Um, next slide. So uh, that's information on the budget uh, for fiscal 21 and how we're going to proceed uh, without having a town meeting uh, like we normally do in the, in the month of May. And then on to uh, some financial matters related to COVID-19. Um, and I know some of this might be repetitive, but for people that are tuning in and hadn't, haven't seen uh, prior meetings, uh, the town of Shrewsbury, uh, like every other community in the Commonwealth, has been allocated a certain amount of funding from uh, federal stimulus funding uh, from the CARES Act. Uh, it's a per capita amount for the total populations of $90 per person. Uh, so Shrewsbury's allocation is uh, just over $3.3 million. Uh, but this is very different than uh, what some people might have experienced in terms of receiving a stimulus refund uh, from their tax return. Uh, those are, again, that might come in the form of a check or a debit card or electronic payment to their, to their bank account, and people can use that money for whatever they please. Uh, this $3.3 million CARES Act funding is very different. It is uh, use restricted and time restricted. And the uses for which we can use uh, this money uh, has to be directly related to COVID-19 related expenditures. And secondly, the funds are uh, eligible for use uh, only up to December 30th. So it's both use and time restricted. It's not some sort of general fund uh, receipt. Um, the town has to make application for these funds uh, using a very uh, detailed application with uh, lots of justification around providing explicit details of each type of expenditure uh, in certain categories that have been defined by the federal government. Um, and uh, as of right now, um, this $3.3 million, uh, again, is only related to COVID-19 related expenditures uh, between March and December. Um, so we've been in conversation with the town manager's office and um, uh, had a conversation with him about uh, uses of these funds. And that leads to the next slide, um, which is uh, that we have uh, submitted for reimbursement uh, to access that funding stream uh, expenditures related to personal protective equipment uh, that Dr. Sawyer referenced earlier that will be required for uh, both uh, summer uh, special education uh, services, if those are uh, at some point provided in person, and then also for the fall reopening. Uh, so we've made some expenditures now to uh, source things like masks, hygiene items, uh, hand sanitizer, face shields, um, disposable gowns and bonnets and booties for uh, school nurses. Um, and uh, those are all eligible uh, categorical expenditures out of that CARES funding. Also, uh, from your last meeting, you know that uh, we need to procure uh, and have in place this capacity for continuation of remote learning next fall, um, because we're not really sure how we're going to or when we're going to reopen or under what circumstances, if it's a hybrid model or alternating schedule, or if we have some sort of flare up and need to, again, uh, close the entire district. So we need that um, ready uh, remote learning capacity. So uh, software services uh, like the programs, uh, Mrs. Clowder talked about, Alex, Freckle, ST Math, um, those software programs we've submitted for reimbursement for, along with additional iPads to uh, ensure that we have a one-to-one -one device for all of our K through 12 students. Um, Again, all of those things would be necessary to work in uh, whatever environment uh, that we're faced with, whether it's in person or hybrid come the fall or having intermittent closures. And uh, we know that given the uh, additional procurement of one-to-one uh, -one devices for uh, that capacity at the K through four level that we're absolutely going to need additional IT support um, to support staff and uh, students in terms of uh, managing those systems. Um, so 
Uh, I'll turn it back to Dr. Sawyer for any additional information related to uh, this COVID-19 fiscal update. Uh, and I know uh, Ms. Clotter will add some information in a moment, but I do want to underscore and thank uh, Mr. Collins, Mr. Uh, Brian LaRue, our Director of Information Technology, along with uh, Ms. Clotter, our Curriculum uh, Assistant Superintendent, relative to this plan for providing devices. The elementary leadership team, um, Shauna Powers, our Director of, of Instructional Technology, uh, all concurred that in order to be able to be as effective as we need to be in a, a hybrid remote environment next fall, um, our elementary students need access uh, to a device. So, you know, it was a, many of our students were able to share a device, uh, say with a middle school sibling who had an iPad already, uh, the way things were structured this spring, uh, but that won't be a reality in the fall. And so uh, being able to stretch the life of the iPads that our eighth graders and 12th graders will be turning in after their four year uh, cycle with those students, um, as well as uh, to take advantage of the ones we have and then utilize this federal funding uh, piece for grade three and four, um, who also have to take the MCAS uh, on uh, um, using technology, which has been the case for the last couple of years. Um, I think it's a good plan. And I absolutely concur that uh, we do need additional IT support staffing. That's something that Mr. LaRue has made an excellent case for in recent years. We haven't been able to uh, give him the level of staffing support we would have liked. Uh, but given the demands of remote learning, even now, uh, they've been stretched over the course of the last couple of months. And then with these additional devices, it will be critical um, to add uh, that position uh, in next year's budget, which of course, we're very mindful of any expense, but this is essentially the cost of doing business um, under these circumstances. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Clowder, who has a few uh, pieces of information to share before we wrap up. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. Uh, we certainly faced our share of challenges, uh, both with the pandemic and um, with the murder of George Floyd and all that that brings to our families. I want to also begin by expressing some gratitude for the bright spots and the learning that we've done together through the challenges. I think one of the powerful lessons we've learned as we reflect midway in the last week of remote learning is that we've been able to strengthen the relationships among colleagues within the school department, but also in the community as a result of some of the challenges we faced. I wanna start off by just saying, I'm really proud of the way our allied arts departments have found ways around the limits of remote learning to continue to engage students in special subjects. Much like uh, Mr. Wensky was talking about the high school team finding how to hold on to the very best moments of graduation in a remote situation, um, our virtual art shows, remote dance-offs, 5Ks and field days, music lessons at a distance have all really enriched the remote learning experience. And I don't wanna overlook that in talking about the powerful ways we've adjusted to classroom learning. If you haven't had a chance to see the art show, um, Mrs. LeBlanc has made it easy to access in the community bulletin. And the format also makes it easy to look at art relative to your child's level. Just a note, because the work is so vast and represents the entire district, it, the selections reflect a sample, so you might not find your child's artwork, but I think it helps give you a sense of um, the talent uh, in our colleagues and um, the impact it has on students. The next acknowledgement I have is really has to do with um, a different kind of collaborative re relationship, and that's the one we're building with the community. Um, Dr. Lazat's position has afforded us ways to connect in, in ways that are new. And I wanna acknowledge her efforts to most recently seek some help from Staples and they really um, helped us to get the word out around summer learning resources. So I wanna acknowledge Jim Ryan, who's the general manager at Staples and Lewis, who's the print and marketing supervisor and Kevin, the print and marketing associate who helped to print all these postcards so that we could distribute them between um, ordering them on Friday and getting them on Sunday. Uh, they really expended a great deal of effort and contributed almost you know, $1,600 in materials to help us um, get the word out in a way that was cost-free to the, to the district. This golden ticket is a reminder card for every student, um, which helps us to link in one spot all of the resources that are gonna be available for summer learning and um, whether you access it with a link or with a QR code, um, you'll get to a place where you can see firsthand 
um, some of the ways to get smarter this summer. And so I really encourage parents to put that card in a place on the fridge or on your corkboard, um, wherever you're gonna see it as a reminder, um, because it's a one, one stop shop to get to all that you need for summer support. And this summer, uh, regular practice is gonna be more important than ever. And finally, um, this headline was taken from Edutopia, which is a web-based resource for educators. In the wake of uh, the death of George Floyd, our educators, much like the community at large, grappling with how to address issues of race and equity. And this slide serves to remind me about the contributions local groups have had both in formal ways and informal ways to compile resources to support families in talking about race with children. Uh, children recognize difference and reflect bias much sooner than we think as early as preschool um, and discussing race and sometimes even providing information to children can be uncomfortable, um, but doing it makes students feel enabled and empowered to talk about their experiences and the very real challenges, particularly that people of color face in our society. And we know that when we talk through an issue, we're better able to find a way forward. So we're compiling a resource uh, both to address the specific topic of uh, talking about racism, but also um, to in raise awareness about books of featuring students of color doing very typical things, um, because I think it's important that, uh, you know, when we think of people of color, we think of them in dimensions just as we do with any other, other person. And um, sometimes I think in focusing on what we need to fix, uh, we lose sight of the very real ways and very um, normal challenges that, that everyone faces as human beings. So we plan to highlight some specific text helpful to grade spans, and this information will be included in our summer resources, but also as a standalone uh, resource on the district website eventually. Now this brings me to the main focus of my update this evening, which is the District Student Opportunity Act plan. Um, as you know, Chapter 70 program is the major program for state funding aid to public elementary and secondary schools. And based on the formula, Shrewsbury's Chapter 70 funding has only increased by minimum aid over the last many years. And that will be the same case next year, unless Chapter 70 funding is cut because of the state budget crisis. Currently, we're slated to receive an additional $30 per student of minimum aid, which totals $186,210, which, as you know, is not nearly sufficient to cover our additional costs. Because of the new Student Opportunity Act state legislation is tied to Chapter 70, starting this year, any increases in Chapter 70 funds must be aligned with certain requirements in the Student Opportunity Act and state educational priorities as an accountability measure are included in that. So this was designed because districts with high poverty rates were slated to receive significant additional funding. And as such, every district is now required to submit a plan for how these funds will be expended. The plan we will ask the school committee to approve next week will show that these funds will be expended on two state priorities that are also priorities for our district, expanding full day kindergarten access and providing inclusive special education through co-teaching. Again, to be clear, this is not a new source of funding that we otherwise would not have received, but rather a new state requirement that we indicate how we will spend the small increase in chapter seven funding we receive each year. And given the state budget crisis, it's unclear at this time if we will even receive any increase or have a reduction for the coming year. So how are districts being directed to spend Student Opportunity Act funds? Uh, this slide illustrates um, that the purpose of the Student Opportunity Act overall is to close achievement gaps. And the advice from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education was to commit to a small number of high impact evidence-based programs these are some examples of evidence-based programs. The DESE was also clear that districts can adopt, deepen, or continue evidence-based programs that are already in use. And so with that in mind, we chose to focus on our strategic plan and to apportion these funds towards the goals I mentioned, which are um, inclusion and co-teaching and full day K. Specifically, we were going to allocate $96,200 for advancing the co-teaching inclusion special education programming next year, and the remaining $90,010 will be allocated to offsetting full day kindergarten costs. You'll recall that to form our strategic plan, we engaged the community and identified 
identifying needs, and these are reflected in the decisions we've made regarding the Student Opportunity Act funds. Again, these are not new dollars, but funds we had already earmarked for Shrewsbury Public Schools. What's new is the documentation that's required by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. So part of the documentation entails reaching out specifically to the community for feedback. And so to complement tonight's presentation, I'll be sending a follow-up communication to Shrewsbury families. And in that document, I will include a link to a Google form so that we can collect the thoughts, concerns, and questions of the community. Um, again, engaging community, uh, engaging the community as partners is a shared value, and the feedback is important to us, regardless of the uh, requirements of the act. Um, but we look forward to hearing what people think of that decision. Thank you, Ms. Clutter. Um, so at this point, uh, that's the update we have for the school committee. We're happy to answer any questions that the committee has. There we go. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Jason? I just want to thank the superintendent in particular for the update with regard to the state guidance. I had heard from a few parents. I know there was a great deal of media attention mm -hmm. uh, around some guidance that was, uh, as I understand it, intended for summer programming. Uh, that caused a significant amount of alarm. And I know that it's the preference of the administration not to put the uh, uh, apple cart before the horse, so to speak. Uh, but I do appreciate that clarification because I know that I too saw some of those media reports and uh, was substantially alarmed at, at the resource outlay that that would require. But I just want to thank uh, the superintendent for specifying that uh, we are still awaiting that state level guidance. Thanks, Jason. Anyone else have any comments or questions? I'm seeing none. Great. Thank, and thank you to Dr. Sawyer and staff. The, I think this is very helpful that we're getting these updates really on a weekly basis. The community um, is getting real-time information. And I've heard that you know it's it's very welcome, especially now where things are a little different. Um, to have this information up front is much um, is really beneficial. So thanks a lot. And I know a lot of work goes into all of this. So thank you. Okay, next on the agenda is uh, student recognition. Shrewsbury High School's Rocket League and League of, Nation League of Legends teams defended their state champion esports titles once again for the spring 2020 season. The Varsity League of Legends team, the SHS Gatekeepers, beat Natick High School, and the Varsity Rocket League team, the SHS CEOs, beat Southwick Regional High School to win. Coach Steve McKinstry and student representatives Jerry Dew and Riley Crowell will address the committee this evening. So welcome. Hey everybody, thanks for having us. My name is Steve McKinstry. I'm the sports coach at the uh, Shrewsbury High School and uh, we're very happy to be here tonight. Um, I had a quick presentation. Uh, I just wanted to give uh, for the um, public just on quickly what uh, esports is all about and uh, the accomplishments of our uh, esports teams. Um, I'm going to share that right now, Coach McKinstry. All right, thumbs up if you guys can see that. Looks good. Thank you. All right. So, um, we're we're asked a lot what uh what esports really is, and um, it's so up and coming. Um, even just a few years ago, really, we didn't know what it was. Um, so just a quick, quick rundown. Um, esports actually stands for electronic sports, um, but it's not just video games. It's not sitting in a room isolated by yourself and plugging in with a controller and headset and playing by yourself the entire time. Um, it's competitive gameplay, um, organized teamwork, and uh, some really strict uh, set of rules. Um, esports is all about teamwork and communication, strategic thinking, and leadership. So uh, the same things that the uh, physical athletes uh, show on the field, um, what we're displaying that uh, electronically um, in, the, in the same fashion. Um, just a little bit of background information on how fast it's exploding. Um, there are about 440 million fans worldwide. So uh, teens that are polled uh, generally come out about 72% of teens say they play video games regularly. So it, it be silly not to try to pull those uh, those teens in at the high school level and and try to get them involved in a, a team and and uh, uh, have some of the same leadership skills and and grow uh, in that fashion as uh, our traditional athletes do. Um, 
there are a ton of scholarship uh, opportunities that are quickly coming. Uh, colleges are jumping on boards to uh, really grab high school esports players and uh, get them in their programs. Um, it's it's really a good time to be a gamer and um, capitalize on some of this. Um, and kids love it. Um, so 72% of kids uh, play video games. They love it. They love being around their friends. Um, it's, good, it's good stuff. Um, our next uh, slide is just all about um, Play Versus, our sponsoring agency. Um, they worked with the MSAA, not, not the MIAA, so um, not actually a, a sport, I suppose, but uh, the Massachusetts uh, School Administrators Association is sponsoring it with Play Versus. And um, in the fall of 2018, we started uh, season zero exclusively with League of Legends. Um, we came into the scene, we were one the first five states, uh, Massachusetts was uh, in there, and we, we came in with uh, four teams that season, and uh, the gatekeepers were, were formed. Um, we went in with a quite a different group of uh, students. We had some graduating seniors last year that uh, left us, uh, but we did come home with a state championship. Um, season one, which was uh, spring of 2019, uh, we uh, introduced our Rocket League team, um, which was Riley and his group. And uh, uh, Shrewsbury High has won every single state championship since. Um, so we're holding all seven state championships right now uh, in both games. It was pretty good. And I'm gonna pass over to Jerry Dew, our senior uh, captain of the uh, gatekeepers. Um, Joe, if you could just go back one slide. Thank you. Hi, uh, so my name is Jerry Dew and I was the captain of the fall season. So as a quick summary, League of Legends is a five versus five multiplayer online battle arena game. So each player has a different role that encompasses many unique responsibilities. And the objective is to destroy a structure called a nexus in each base. So this was my uh, team's roster for both seasons. So our roster was considerably different compared to last year because of graduating seniors. This year, we had four seniors, one junior, and one sophomore. So the roster was me, Trevor Dodson, Justin Dirk, Jack Doyle, Sajed Ziad, and our substitute, Roel Martins. So this was our bracket for the spring season. In the first round, we had a bye. In the second round, we played Newton South High School blue team. So Newton South was the school that we played in the season, season zero championship. So they were a pretty tough team to beat. In the third uh, round, we played Braintree High School before advancing to the finals. In the finals, we played Natick High School, who put up a great fight, but we managed to win 2-0. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we were not able to play in person, so we couldn't take a team picture in the end, but it marked our fourth win in a row. So this was a picture of us at the Season 2 Fall State Championships at Helix, Helix Esports Place in Foxborough. Here we defeated Acton Boxborough Regional High School 2-0. We all had agreed that this was the toughest team to play against, given how some of their uh, team members were ranked in the top 500 players in North America. Starting from the left is Coach McKintree, then Sajed Ziad, then Tristan Dirk, then me, Jerry Dew, then Robo Martins, then, Trist then Trevor Dodson, and finally Jack Doyle. And now for Rocket League. So I'm Riley Kroll. I'm a senior at Shrewsbury, and I've been a captain for the Rocket League team since play, uh, season one of Play Versus, which was spring of 2019. Uh, Rocket League, as an overview, it's basically just playing soccer with rocket-powered cars, and you try and score more goals in a five-minute game than the other team. Uh, my teammates were sophomores Trevor Perduta and Sky Pemberton, and as a team, we've won three state championships together, and I'm very confident in Trevor and Sky's ability to win more in the future because they're great players. Uh, this season, we played Sutton in the first round of the playoffs and then faced off against Southwick Regional in the state championship. They were a very solid team, and they kept it close the whole series, but we ultimately took the win home. And this is a picture of us at Helix Esports this fall after winning the fall 19, 2019 state championship over Andover. It was a great experience to play at the new venue at Patriot Place, and we were one of the first people to use the venue, which was an awesome experience. And if you guys have any questions for us, we'd be happy to answer them. 
Great, thank you everyone. That was a great presentation. The, the committee have any questions or comments? Uh, not J John. Yeah, just a quick question. First off, congratulations uh, to all involved. Uh, I've been following this since uh, you started that first season and uh, notice you have about five seniors. What is uh, what does the roster look like for uh, for next year? And it sounds like Riley, you're pretty confident in uh, the team's capabilities to uh, to do it again. Yeah, so uh, going into next year, uh, we're, we're going to go in strong in uh, fall 20. Um, we have uh, two of our players on the gate gatekeepers are coming along in the fall, and uh, we'll be able to have a team rebuild. Um, we do have a uh, uh, multiple uh, League of Legends teams, um, so we'll be able to piece together a uh, a team to, to defend the state titles. And as far as Rocket League goes, I, I have absolute faith in uh, Trevor and Sky to, to defend those titles as well. So we're hoping to hold them. Great. And just remind us again, how many teams compete uh, statewide? So statewide, uh, League of Legends, I believe this se past season had about 32 teams and the Rocket League, uh, I believe they had 16. Um, every season it, it varies a little bit, uh, but yeah, it usually falls in about three, 30 and 16. Nice. Well, Shrewsbury's the team to beat, so congratulations. Anyone else? I'm not saying anything. Congratulations. And I know um, back when this I started as a mother. To to make. Go ahead, Jason. No, Mrs. Ep Ms. Heffernan had a, was raising her hand. There's so many people. You have to wait. There's a lot of people. I know. I've had to jump around. Uh, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say I'm sorry to, to, to cut you off, Sandy. I uh, very excited about this. Um, I have to also say that my sixth grader, I recently mentioned this to him and he was like, what are you talking about? I can play video games and that's like a, 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 a you know, a part of school somehow. So um, just it's so exciting to see how you're, how you're developing it and, um, and congratulations on your win. Can I ask a, a question and maybe this is best to the, to the coach. Do you have, um, the, the teams seem pretty male dominated. Are there, are there, are there, are there, Young women who are who are participating as as well, or do we just see that by nature boys are more interested in video games generally? Um, so our our season zero team did have a, a female on team, and she did compete in the the state finals. Yep. Um, and uh, this past season we also did have a, a another female. So uh, yep, yep, we do, we do. Awesome, awesome, and exciting. It's it's exciting stuff. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think everyone looking, nobody's waving. Yeah, just, I was uh, gonna say, as a, as a mom, when this first came on our agenda a few years ago, I remember saying, what is eSports? And my son had to explain it to me. And I still look, are they just playing video games? And how does this work? And I think when you learn about the teamwork, what goes into it, um, it it's quite an accomplishment. And it's, um, it is, it's, I, I know how to describe it because I don't, I'm not a video gamer, but people I know who said, this is such an amazing thing. It's a big business now. Like uh, Mr. Hinsley said, colleges are offering scholarships. So it's, it's a wonderful uh, thing for Shoesbury High. I think we also have the best logo when I'm looking at the team. So is, was that designed by someone at the high school? Um, I, I did reach out to a graphic designer to, to have that one pulled in. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. It, it stands out. And I th uh, thought it was interesting because the day of the championship, I have a 28 year old who is in sports apparel and he starts texting me how you had won again the state championship yet again and i'm like how do you know this he goes oh and, and he works for a pretty big company and they're actually watching this stuff online because they're looking to see what's trending what's going on so i, I mean i think you guys have some bright futures ahead of you and it's a it's a big industry now so congratulations um you're just like frequent flyers. Every time you go, you win. So congratulations. Dr. Sir, any comments or questions? Just briefly, uh, congratulations to Coach McKinstry and to the uh, students on their championships. Uh, again, this is a really incredible level of success that they've achieved. And I think that as was mentioned, um, it represents um, really a, a level of teamwork and perseverance and skill. Uh, a lot of things that we're trying to uh, help developing our students uh, as part of our portrait of a Shrewsbury graduate and I think these uh, these students exemplify lots of those different characteristics and traits so thank you to Jerry and Riley for presenting information tonight along with coach McKinstry and congratulations to the teams and uh, uh, bravo congratulations I'm sure we'll see you again thank you so much okay thank next you. on the agenda which is our year-end uh, event that we 
are sad about, but we're really happy to celebrate with. It's our staff recognition for retiring staff members. And Ms. Malone will provide the information. Sure, so thank you, Mrs. Fritz. Um, so 22 faculty and staff are ending their educational careers with the closing of this chapter of unusual year for education. I feel like probably their last three months was the most challenging that they've ever faced in their careers. Um, and they certainly deserve their retirement. So many, many people are on the call who are retiring. We do have a handful of our professional um, faculty who will speak and say a few words. Um, but first I'd like to recognize, recognize our paraprofessionals. Um, so Mary Benjamin has served 15 years in Shrewsbury. She is retiring from the Walter J. Patton School. Donna Collins has served 14 years in Shrewsbury. She is retiring from Parker Road Preschool. Deborah Dernan has served 12 years in Shrewsbury. She is retiring from Shrewsbury High School. Sharon Laramie has served 16 years in Shrewsbury. She is retiring from Spring Street School. Jane Panetta has served seven years in Shrewsbury and she has retired a little earlier in the year from Parker Road Preschool. Kathy Mangan has served 24 years in Shrewsbury. She is retiring from Shrewsbury High School. Hal Newman has served 16 years in Shrewsbury. He's retiring from Oak Middle School. Cindy Toseski has served 21 years and she's retiring from Sherwood Middle School. And Nancy Watson has served 48 years in Shrewsbury. She previously served as a teacher retiring from Coolidge and then worked part-time as a paraprofessional. And so she is now retiring for the second time. And this time it's from Spring Street School. We have so much appreciation for our paraprofessionals. They are the glue that, that holds um, schools together. This is the largest number of retirees I've seen in my eight years uh, in my role um, from the paraprofessional ranks. And it's very gratifying to see um, that so many truly made long, productive careers here with us. And we appreciate all of their accomplishments so much. So thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. We're gonna move now to our secretarial and administrative assistant um, retirees. And I know we have on the call, Barbara Barasa. I can see her face on the screen in front of me. She has served 26 years and she is retiring as the school secretary administrative assistant from Parker Road Preschool. So you can imagine all the contributions to family and, and students across that career. And we also have Gail King. She served eight years in Shrewsbury in two different uh, sections of time. She is retiring as the school counseling department administrative assistant or what used to be called the guidance secretary. Um, from Shrewsbury High School. So um, another person who provided a good deal of um, commitment and help to our students, our families, and our staff. I'd like to um, move on to our teachers and professional staff. Um, to be very kind, I'll just remind all of you to unmute when you it's your turn to speak. And I have... Um, a couple of people who, who preferred not to speak, but I would still like to mention their names. Nancy Bedard has served 12 years as an educator here. She is retiring as a media specialist from Oak Middle School. Norma Chico has served 10 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. She is retiring as a physics teacher from Shrewsbury High School. Linda DeRozier has served 13 years as an educator in Shrewsbury. I think you saw her picture on the screen a little earlier. She is retiring as a special education teacher from Shrewsbury High School. Anne Ernest has served 19 years as an educator in Shrewsbury, and she is retiring as a Spanish teacher from Shrewsbury High School. So now we come to Sarah Honig, who's one of the people who has agreed to speak. She's been with us for seven years as an educator. She came here just a year after me. She is retiring as both our director of foreign languages 
and as a Latin teacher at Oak Middle School. She's also taught Latin at the high school. So I'd like to um, ask Sarah to say a few words, please. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for this opportunity. Um, when I was looking for a job in administration, I um, was told that Shrewsbury had an re excellent reputation and you all prove, prove that correct. Uh, this has been the best place I've ever worked. I was a de department director before this for seven years at a different school. And of all the different places I've worked, this has been my really the most rewarding place. I, I think it's part of it is because of the people here I, and how supported I have felt from the um, all, all the administrators at the different schools and I've worked with the Sherwood and the Oak and the high school um, people. <clears throat> Everyone's been very, just so helpful, such a great resource. Um, I want to single out um, Amy Clowder and Todd Bazidlo, who are my supervisors, who were always ready to roll up their sleeves and help me through any particular um, challenging situation I was facing. And were really willing to brainstorm with me um, and help me and guide me. And um, my staff, I just can't say enough good things about them. They are dedicated professionals. They care about kids. They've worked so hard to engage them during this remote learning um, period. And they've been taking, doing free webinars, learning new strategies on how they can engage kids. So they've really, um, I just can't say enough good things about them. And I, I just, I really feel like they're the best and they deserve the best. And so I know you're facing very challenging times ahead, but I just want you to know, um, I'm just very grateful I had this opportunity. Thank you so much. I'll always remember you at fondly and just so many great memories. And I'm going to be living in Southern Vermont. So if you're ever in Southern Vermont and you wanna try some goat cheese, my husband and I have a business there now, we just started. So, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's a bittersweet time for me as I am gonna miss everyone. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Thank you, Sarah. And now I'd like to move on to Amy Johnson. And I know Amy, Amy is here. She has served 33 years as an educator in this town. She's retiring as a science teacher from Oak Middle School, a woman in science many years ago. And Amy has also agreed to uh, say a few words for us. So Amy, if you want to unmute, you can go ahead and make your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for this opportunity. Isn't life funny? So many beautiful colors, so many possibilities. More than half of my career has been spent working on the seven gold team in the Shrewsbury Middle Schools. Five red was dynamite, got things started for my first six years at the original Shrewsbury Middle School, followed by seven blue, seven gold, seven yellow in the old Sherwood Middle School, seven green for two years when Oak Middle School first reopened, and then back to seven gold for the rest of my wonderful career here at Oak in Shrewsbury. Rainbows are beautiful and so have all of the amazing students and faculty I have been had the privilege of working with over the past 33 years in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Isn't life complicated? Who would have thought that a microscopic thing like a virus could change our life, our routines, our world so dramatically? It is times like these that help us revisit what is most important in our lives. Things like our health, family, and happiness. We don't often take the time to think about the things that we are so lucky to have, like a quick interaction with a friend, or a smile as we pass another person in the hall, on the field, or on the street. The things we do, the choices we make, affect those around us. It is important to make good choices and to consider how our choices might impact others. Sometimes things come easy, but often we must work hard for the good things in life, but that just makes us appreciate them that much more. Isn't life grand? Sometimes it isn't what you say, it is what you do. Sometimes it's not what you say, but how you say it. Here's a few things to think about from someone who spent 35 years in the classroom. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. Seek happiness.
take a walk. It's a good way to clear your mind. It is nice to be important, but it's more important to be nice. We are all responsible for our own happiness. Life is never simple or easy, but it's worth it. Look for the beauty that surrounds you. Tomorrow's a new day. Life doesn't come with guarantees, only opportunities. As several good friends wrote this year, being a good teacher includes wearing many hats. I am so lucky, lucky to have had a wardrobe of support to help me enjoy a lifetime of blessing. I encourage all of you to look for those moments in your life when you can make a difference to someone else. Those are the events that make life worth living. I am grateful for the kaleidoscope of images, memories, and shared moments that swirl around in my mind from my seconds, minutes, days, and years in the Shrewsbury Middle Schools and all of the people who have touched my life in such a special way with warmth and appreciation. Thank you all, Amy Johnson. Thank you so much, Ms. Johnson, very much appreciated. I'd like to also mention that Nancy Lowry has served 18 years and she is retiring as a mathematics teacher from Shrewsbury High School. And now I'd like to take a moment to read statements on behalf of two retiring educators. The first is Kathy McDonough. She served 17 years here in Shrewsbury and she's retiring as a math teacher from Shrewsbury High School. On her behalf, she would like me to thank the district for taking a chance on her after her first 17 years, which were in another district. She deeply appreciates the perpetual professional growth she has experienced here, and especially wants to thank mathematics director, Jean Marie Johnson for her tireless mentoring. She concluded her statement to me by saying that she regards herself as incredibly lucky to have had 17 years at Shrewsbury High School. I would also like to mention um, that I have a statement from Gail King. I had read her name a little bit earlier with the, uh, she's, the she's the guidance secretary who has retired and she has also given me a statement to read. She says that she would like to thank the school committee and Shrewsbury Public School Administration for the recognition this evening. It has been an honor for me to work for this excellent district. The dedication to students and families that I have observed demonstrated by all in school employees, no matter the role, is something this committee can be extremely proud of. I genuinely appreciate the opportunity that was given to me to be part of this outstanding team. I'd also like to mention Kathy Sibeli. And I was fortunate to work on a project with her these last couple of years and got to know her a little bit better too. Um, she has served 27 years in our community. She is retiring as a science teacher from Oak Middle School. And now we're moving to our final two uh, retirees, both of whom are speaking. Robert Cicino has served 32 years as an educator and he is retiring as an English teacher from Shrewsbury High School. Mr. Cicino, would you like to make your comments? Now that I'm unmuted, yes, thank you. Uh, before, before I read what I've written, I'd like to say hello to Jason, uh, my former uh, advanced placement English student. Uh, and I, I, Jason, I remember well that you were also one of the leaders uh, for speech and debate at that time. And I'll tell you that uh, with a lot of pride, I'll be voting for you once again uh, in, uh, in just a few weeks or, or, or less than that. Okay, so that's, that's for Jason. I, I have written some, uh, some things down and I'll, uh, I'll read from what I've written. Thank you. So I wanna thank you for honoring us in this way tonight. And I know we all sincerely appreciate it. In my 37 years of teaching, change has been the constant feature. When I began teaching in Philadelphia in 1982, the personal desktop computer had just arrived, big and clunky as it was. Since then, the innovations in computer science and technology have multiplied and accelerated. Without question, these changes have affected education profoundly. And yet, despite all the impressive technological changes, the basic facts of human nature have not changed. 
at its best, teaching and learning is a face-to-face, human-to-human interaction. It's people helping people. It works best when we're physically present. Learning is social and emotional and intensely personal. This is true, especially for young people. Young people need and want the guidance, the structure, and the wisdom that adults with life experience can provide. And they want us to provide it up close and in person. We know this is true. And it's not just true, it's beautiful. The personal relationships I've enjoyed with my students as we explore literature and the subject of English together have been the most gratifying part of my career. Since the middle of March, the coronavirus pandemic has temporarily forced the closure of school buildings and required that we hold classes remotely. This experience has proved all the more strongly that teaching and learning work best in person. When the science deems it safe, students and teachers will meet together once again in the classrooms. And when that happens, I know that Shrewsbury teachers will do their very best. We always have. Next fall, I will watch this historic once in a career pandemic unfold from the sidelines with the greatest respect for all that you do for Shrewsbury's young people. I'm very grateful that I've been allowed to play such a personal role in the lives of so many Shrewsbury students and their families for more than three decades. And just before I, uh, I uh, finish, I'd like to uh, thank very, very much the, the entire English department that I've worked with. Uh, and that includes, of course, Liza Trombley, our uh, department chair, and all of the uh, 15, 16, I, I, I forget the actual number of um, d- d- talented, hardworking people. And I've just so much enjoyed uh, working alongside them. So I wanna thank them very much and thank you very much. Thank you. Now I would like to um, turn it over to Katie Zimmer- Zimmerman. She has served 20 years in Shrewsbury and she is retiring as the the school nurse from the Calvin Coolidge School. Katie. Thank you, always last. Um, I just wanna thank you as a school nurse, I had a wonderful and a unique opportunity to take care of our students, both their physical needs as well as their mental health needs. I've worked very hard to know each and every one of my students their families, their challenges they face daily, and the years have flown. And it's been wonderful. And I can't wait to see what the future will bring. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Thank you. It's hard to to applaud on 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 the Zoom, but I think we all feel like that's the natural thing to do. We we are so gratified by the contributions all of you have made to us. Um, I, I see faces of people that I, I loved and known for the last eight years myself, and I just want to thank everybody for their contributions, and I'm sure that um, Ms. Fritz or Dr. Sawyer will also have a comment or two to say, so I'll turn it back over to them, but thank you. Thanks, Barb. Before I make any comments, does the uh, school committee have any comments they'd like to make? I'm looking around, I think we're good. Uh, John. Yeah, just uh, a few quick comments. First off, thank you to all of you for your years of service uh, to our students and our community. Really appreciate it. This is one of my favorite meetings of the year, uh, obviously not to say goodbye, to say, but to say thank you. Uh, truly uh, just uh, remarkable years of service from teachers, paraprofessionals, secretaries, and professional staff. I uh, appreciate the great sentiments that Sarah shared about uh, supportive work and environment. Uh, and then Mr. Cicino, I wanna thank you for the outstanding graduation speech uh, last week. I know as a, as a parent of a graduate, it really meant a lot, uh, you know, very moving and so appropriate for the times that we're living in. Uh, and then on a personal note, uh, Ms. Johnson uh, was my son's uh, you know, uh, science teacher. I uh, appreciate uh, your support of Jack and Seven Gold. Um, and then uh, to Katie Zimmerman as well, appreciate your dedication to the safety and health of our students at Coolidge. Obviously being the, the son of a retired school nurse myself, I wanna say thank you. Uh, and again, just thank you to, to everyone for their, for their years of service in Shrewsbury. Thanks, John. Again, thank you. I, you know, we talk about 
about results a lot. You know, as a school committee, we look at measurements and these results would not be where they were if it wasn't for the educators and everybody involved with our students day to day. It's not an easy job. There's a lot of uh, issues I think the public probably doesn't even know about that goes on in classrooms and you power through it. You make sure that students are always number one. Um, so Sarah, when you said bittersweet, I think it's bittersweet for the district because we have a great group of educators who are having deserved retirements, but we're losing a lot of talent. Um, but you've made Shrewsbury Public Schools a better place just for being here. So on behalf of the committee, I'd like to wish you all the best, a long and happy um, and fulfilling retirement. Dr. Sawyer, any comments? I also want to congratulate all of our retirees. Uh, as the report and as Malone mentioned, they represent a collective over 400 years of uh, collective experience uh, that we'll be losing um, to our detriment, of course, uh, but uh, they, you know, we continue to have, uh, uh, they've, they've had a great impact on the colleagues who remain behind, uh, who will still be practicing. Uh, I know that as they go into retirement, uh, one thing that they certainly have the benefit of is knowing that the work they did was uh, very important. Uh, they affected positively the lives of literally thousands upon thousands of children over their careers. Um, and that is something for which uh, I, and uh, on behalf of the school district and the community, um, I'm enormously grateful. So thank you uh, for sharing your talents uh, and your time and your efforts uh, with us in Shrewsbury. Uh, we wish you nothing but the very best uh, for a healthy and happy retirement. And uh, thank you again for all the contributions you made. Thank you, Dr. Sawyer. And thank you again, everyone. Okay, next on the agenda, uh, Dr. Lazard our Assistant Superintendent for Community Partnerships and Wellbeing, along with Mary Simone, the General Manager of the Worcester AC Hotel by Marriott, and Kevin Mizakar, Town Manager for the Town of Shrewsbury, are going to have a presentation. The first part will be on the Colonial Connections Program, and the second will be on uh, the Wellbeing Report. I'll turn over to Dr. Lazat. Thank you very much. And Dr. Sawyer, will you put the presentation up? There we go. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting us to speak with you and the Shrewsbury community this evening to share some of the ways in which community partnerships are being developed in our school communities while we focus our attention on the mental and physical well being of students, staff, and families. Tonight, I am joined by Mr. Kevin Mizakar our town manager, and Mary Simone, general manager of AC Hotel by Marriott Worcester, two of the 18 members of the Colonial Connections Advisory Board. During the first 10 weeks in my new role last summer as Assistant Superintendent for Community Partnerships and Wellbeing, I had the opportunity to build this dynamic team. I am indebted to each of these individuals for the time, wisdom, and commitment they have devoted to this critical programming. Before passing the speaking baton or talking stick, as our students would say, to Kevin Mizakar and Mary Simone, I want to draw your attention to the messages that are highlighted in this first slide, as they exemplify the work of the many individuals and teams with whom I have had the privilege to collaborate over the past 11 months. I look forward to continuing elements of this important work as I transition into my new role as acting principal of Patton School. Next slide, please. At this time, I invite Kevin to share. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lazat. Um, thank you to the members of the school committee and Dr. Sawyer and the rest of your leadership team uh, for allowing me to um, talk about Colonial Connections Advisory Board and the great work that we get to do with an extremely talented group of people that Dr. Lazat put together. Uh, first, just some background, as you see on the screen, Colonial Connections is a partnership between the Shrewsbury Public Schools and the business community. Um, and we've been focused on providing and finding ways uh, to provide opportunities for our students to develop real world, real world skills and career aware awareness in order to better prepare them for 
uh, success in both their education and eventual career paths. So it's been a, a, a real joy to get together with this diverse group of business leaders and um, members of industry to talk about how we can really pull the students into our organizations and provide meaningful opportunities uh, for them. Um, I was really fortunate to be able to, what I feel kind of expand my role uh, and my time in the classroom, uh, which is very limited um, through um, this, the Colonial Connection. So uh, one of the first things that uh, were done uh, through this group uh, and through Dr. Lazat was uh, Sherwood students working to interview municipal employees at the town hall. Um, they've done, uh, it was an amazing experience uh, with a diverse group of uh, town employees who were interviewed um, by the students and, and every employee uh, was so fortunate and so grateful for the experience that they had in, in interacting with the students as you all know. It's always a joy and uh, certainly was no exception for um, our leadership team at the town hall. Um, uh, speaking of the expansion of what I get to do or my opportunities to be with students in the classroom, um, we really undertook kind of a real world project uh, with Dr. Aloisi's uh, American government class. And uh, in the past, I've been able to uh, join with the class and have conversations generally about local government, but through conversations with Dr. Lazat and Mr. Aloisi, we found a um, project, which is the wonderful Edgemere Redevelopment Project uh, at the former Edgemere Drive-In to really bring the students out of the classroom and learn more about what local government does. Um, uh, you can see on the left side of the screen is uh, myself and the assistant town manager, Kristen Lass, and we were uh, in Dr. Aloisi's classroom, providing them with an overview and trying to enlighten them about the diverse uh, efforts of the town hall employees uh, and public safety officials for a project like this. Um, I'd just like to take a second to, to read a quote, um, a response from one of the students um, that were in the classroom um, during that day, and then we're eventually able to join with local government officials in the field. So actually two brief uh, comments. So the first one is uh, states, quote, what I now understand better is the function of local government. In the beginning, I barely understood what local government was. That's why I took this class. However, after learning about the Edgemere project and meeting with officials in charge of it, I realized it's more than just mayors and councilmen. My group was assigned life safety and building codes. And when we sat down with the officials in charge of the department uh, to discuss their involvement in the project, I was amazed and confused at how much actually goes into local government and how plan becomes building. So, you know, it was one thing for me to always, or to have the opportunity to speak generally about my role uh, in Mr. Aloisi's class, but getting these students out into the town hall and really learning about a specific project, in my opinion, was so much more meaningful. Um, and, and the final uh, comment that I wanted to share from you from a student on this project was, quote, this project drew a lot of connections with other aspects of my life. I'm applying to colleges to be an environmental engineer. So talking to a woman with a jo job similar to what I'll be doing eventually was very informative. One interesting thing that I learned about solar energy is that Selco limits the percentage of power you can get from solar energy, which I heavily disagree with. This kind of knowledge is highly applicable to my field and my meeting with Patty Sheehan almost renewed my excitement for environmental engineering. So uh, I think that's another great example of the connections that we're making with the students um, and certainly uh, much more exciting than uh, just I sit in front of Mr. Aloisi's class. And finally, uh, if you could advance the slide, just one more uh, picture for me. Um, on the right hand side, you know, our recently retired, it's hard for me to say, uh, Selco General Manager Michael Pale uh, during his spotlight interview uh, with a Sherwood's um, student. And on the left is uh, town engineer Andy Truman sharing his experiences with the sixth grade team at middle, uh, Sherwood Middle. Uh, Mr. Sherwood's work in construction in England, England prior to attending Oxford University for civil engineering so our, serves our community very well. Uh, and here he's sh again sharing the details of the Edgemere project. So 
being a part of CCAB um, was both meaningful for me because I think it's a real connection to the community. The more we can help connect with the community about what local government does, the better off we'll all be. And um, it was certainly an, another opportunity for staff to uh, integrate and be exposed to, to uh, the students at all levels. So uh, thank you, Dr. Lazat, for um, your hard work in pulling this all together. And I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Kevin. At this time, I welcome uh, Mary to say a few words. Thank you, Dr. Lazat. Good evening, everyone. Um, during this past year, the Colonial Connection Advisory Board, we had four meetings, two of them which were at local businesses, and one of them was at the high school, and the other one was a virtual meeting, of course. Um, just being on this board, we have a very dynamic board that we put together, and we had some goals this year that we looked at, and of course, we all wanted to increase the aspects to experimental learning for the students, and also have career aspects for all of our students. Three small groups that we put together in presentations, we were able to identify some plans that we were able that we'll have that we'll be able to give to the students for them to have access to positive role models, envision a career, and feel a connection to the business community. We also had great discussions in length about previous programs that we have done at the high school, and we laid some groundwork for future programs to achieve some of the goals that we put down. As many of you know, I've been involved with the MOVE program for several years. And I think that that was probably one of the great examples of how school and business partnerships can be successful. The success of that program was not only because of the students, but because of the administration and the teachers who supported the program. The students benefited from that hands-on learning experience, the real life situations, and that high-paced industry of the hotel business also being successful in the workplace by applying some personal manners in, variety, in a variety of settings. These programs also benefited from the business partner. We found the increased morale of, amongst our associates and a sense of pride in their jobs when teaching their skills. We also benefited from a pool of skilled employees when we had job openings. As a result of being involved with MOVE, I've had the opportunity to become a mentor many of to many of the previous students who went through the program who still reach out to me today for advice and job opportunities. Now more than ever, as, a business, as the business community is reinventing their workforce and business plans for the new normal, the Colonial Connection Advisory Board can be a catalyst to inspire businesses to get involved and engage our students. It's time to connect with our business community and to shape our partnerships for future success. On the next few pages, you're gonna see the names of the individual who made this incredible advisory board. It's with Dr. Lizette's leadership that everyone has committed to another year. And we look forward to the success of this board and providing the best educational opportunities for the students of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary and Kevin and Dr. Sawyer. Thank you for forwarding the slides. Um, there are two slides with the names of our 18 members on the Colonial Connections Advisory Board. And while we're looking at those, if uh, school committee members before Mary and Kevin depart, if you have any questions or comments for them or for me, we're welcome to entertain them. So thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have, I can't see the committee right now, so speak up. If anybody has any questions, just go ahead and speak up. This is Fritz, if I might. I just wanted to commend Dr. Lazat, uh, Mr. Mizakar, and Ms. Simone for participating in this program and for leading this program. I think it's always fantastic when we can give students connections to real world experiences beyond the classroom. Uh, and I know that that's something that we'd like to see incorporated uh, really all over the curriculum at all levels. But it's uh, in the past, it's been rare where we've had the staff resources to be able to focus on that. And I think it's a real benefit of the leadership role that Dr. Lazat has been in. Uh, to make these relationships and these connections on behalf of our district. So I just want to express my appreciation for the work and I'm really pleased to see the result. Thanks, Jason. Anyone else? 
Yeah, Sandy, just really quick, uh, just echo those sentiments. Uh, I think the you know colonial connections piece of, of this inaugural role was always uh, very exciting for me. Uh, and I all, all knew Dr. Lazada had done similar work uh, at Sherwood Middle School uh, when my daughter was there, bringing in local businesses into the classroom. I think it, it really is very impactful um, to take on those real world projects, uh, as, as uh, Kevin uh, mentioned. I'd like to thank uh, everyone involved uh, with this uh, uh, you know, uh, effort. Uh, it's really meaningful uh, and appreciate you sharing uh, uh, the comments. Thanks, John. Not hearing anyone else. I don't think so. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lazad and Kevin and Mary. I too think this um, in this first year, Dr. Lazad laying this groundwork is so important for students. Um, I think when we especially get to the high school level, you're thinking about uh, what maybe major or career you wanna go in and having these types of connections with people actually working in the field is just so important because something you might think is great, you may learn about it and say no and go down a different path, which is wonderful. Or you do have an experience and it's like, yes, this is something I do wanna pursue further either through college or you know trade or going into the workforce that way. So thank you for laying this groundwork. I'm glad that it's going to continue even though you're gonna be on hiatus. Um, I think it's so, so important for students to have these connections with adults in the community as well to help guide them. So thank you. You're very welcome. Kevin and Mary, you're dismissed. I know you have a gazillion other things to do. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. Dr. Lazar, just before they uh, go, just for one yeah. moment, if you don't mind, I just want to also thank uh, Ms. Simone and Mr. Mizakar uh, for partnering with us. I, I think that, uh, you know, Ms. Simone was a longtime partner to the MOVE program, and we're excited with her new role in Worcester um, to connect with her in a different way through the Colonial Connections and, and uh, benefit from her leadership. Um, as far as Mr. Mizakar, um, again, as he described, uh, going beyond, uh, he's been very generous with his time to connect with uh, Mr. Aloisi's class at the high school, uh, but this uh, really made an ongoing connection with lots of different municipal leaders um, that I think our students benefited from, and I, frankly, it was an unintended consequence. Uh, when we created this position, we were certainly looking to connect with the business community, uh, but to make such a rich connection with our uh, municipal departments uh, and helping our students better understand their own community, as well as the potential for careers in municipal leadership uh, and work, uh, I think was a, a real bonus. So uh, I want to appreciate, I thank Mr. Mizikar and, and the other leaders in the town for their time uh, working with our students. Uh, so very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, if you could forward to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, so as you may recall, as school committee members, our students, our legacy uh, pictured on the left here was a program that occurred at the start of the school year and was a culmination of several conversations with alumni and current SHS students held last summer in person and over the phone. Each of the individuals pictured here contributed to the first professional development day for educators in late August. As you know, the 90 minute session consisted of a brief presentation by each of these 14 individuals, each of whom shared their perspective regarding ways in which their education in the Shrewsbury Public Schools influenced them, while also offering insight into ways in which our schools could strengthen student experiences. Their messages were processed by faculty during the faculty meetings that followed that day. Um, on the right side of your screen, um, you will see a picture of a Zoom meeting. Um, I shared a photo a few weeks back, but thank you. Uh, thanks to the incredible work of Kathleen Cohane and Michelle Biscotti, the first ever virtual mentoring series took place in April. The goal of the programming was to provide Shrewsbury High School students with opportunities to engage in informal discussions with graduates of Shrewsbury High School about life after high school as they explore potential opportunities for work, career, and continuing education. Pictured here in this meeting are alumni Kyle Vetter and Asta Gupta both of whom facilitated the computer science Zoom session with SHS students. 
Kyle completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is completing his doctoral studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Asta is entering her junior year at The Ohio State University. Kyle shared, I am happy to provide more information to students about what to expect while pursuing an undergraduate degree in computer science, what to expect when applying for jobs and internships, and the lessons I learned along the way. Um, so that series proved to be very beneficial and we're looking forward to continuing that work. The next slide, please, Joe. Um, pictured here, we have um, going to talk a bit about the Colonial Fund. Um, and again, the um, really stressing the importance of establishing an alumni network through outreach. Kathleen Cohane and Michelle Biscotti, um, along with the efforts of the Colonial Fund Advisory Group, a creative and knowledgeable team of parents and community members consisting of Sarah Port, Mark Murray Jr., Rajesh Valakbudi, Deb Mooney, Ginger Conti, and Mike Albertson um, have really come together and um, shared ideas that have surfaced um, during our meetings. Um, on the left here is a community uh, colonial fund outreach postcard that was sent to several alumni um, during our, um, it was actually sent to 9,000 SHS alumni in an ongoing effort to build an engaging, dynamic alumni network. Pictured on the right is the new Colonial Fund logo that consists of the actions that are the focus of our work, innovate, create, collaborate, inspire, and challenge, along with our mission supporting our district's, district's greatest needs. Um, during some of the ideas that have surfaced during our meetings um, have already come to fruition, including the communication sent by Kathleen, Michelle, and me to Shrewsbury families, community members, and alumni yesterday. The request for donations um, to our schools has already yielded over $9,586 from 58 donors. The average donation is $167. Two alumni made donations on behalf of their children. We have gained four new monthly donors. And as we stated in the donation ask sent yesterday, our district is now confronted with incredibly difficult choices about how to spend significantly fewer budget dollars in the face of greater need. You can help alleviate some of this burden by making a gift to the Colonial Fund. Every dollar we raise will go towards the greatest needs in our district, both current and future, and help preserve the quality of education we have all come to expect in Shrewsbury. The Colonial Fund is an unrest unrestricted fund that has been invaluable to all of our schools sponsoring innovative projects and programs that were too costly to offer without sacrificing existing curriculum or staff. Today, the Colonial Fund is more important than ever as we face a multi-million dollar budget deficit that will challenge how we educate and captivate our students in the coming year. Next slide, please, Joe. To make a donation, this was shown on, in the letter as well, and we'll be um, sending this in a variety of formats, but you can scan, donors can scan this QR code with their phones or visit our Colonial Fund um, website. Next slide, please. Slides 10 through 14 showcase many of the, some of the many ongoing efforts under our strategic priority, enhanced well-being of all. In this slide, uh, we have a picture on the left of the um, 
SHS volunteer fair facilitated by Shrewsbury High School mathematics teacher Denise Satterfield and media specialist Emily Bredberg. Pictured on the left is student Preston Karp joined by fellow classmates. Pictured on the right is another example of enhancing well being of all. Um, you see um, Shrewsbury High School educator Kelly Lawler and her family participating in the very successful virtual 5K that was created by members of the Oak Middle School faculty, along with other district leaders. Next slide, please, Joe. We are very grateful to the 1540 Connection and the Michael Bodge Tribute Fund for providing our students with life-saving lessons um, and these um, presentations were provided a couple months ago. Um, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with Mike Bodge, Shrewsbury High School graduate Mike Bodge embodied kindness, selflessness, courage, and strength. The Shrewsbury Public Schools and specifically Shrewsbury High School is grateful to be the beneficiaries of the efforts of Mike's family, friends, and classmates to bringing 1540's life-saving early detection education to today's Shrewsbury High School students and staff in his memory. Um, again, thank you to 1540. Uh, following their presentation, they had several questions by students and staff, along with offers to get involved in their work. Um, so it was just a very wonderful um, opportunity and it's ongoing as they share their resources and curriculum with us. I'm not going to read from the next two slides, um, slides 12 and um, the, these next two slides um, highlight really um, what the district is doing um, and working on in the area of social emotional learning by co coordinating classroom school-wide family and community practices. And you can see um, Castle's, um, the five focus areas upon which we are um, spending our time and energy um, in exploring and ensuring that our students and staff um, have the opportunity to strengthen in those ways. Um, we know that programming needs to be sequenced, active and focused as shown on this slide. And the next slide, please, Joe. The ongoing um, efforts of social emotional learning and the Shrewsbury Wellness Advisory Committee of which Dr. McGee is a part and thank you for your um, involvement. Um, but we know that uh, students are, are more successful in school and daily life when they um, engage and um, believe in themselves and in others. Um, there are some um, statements here just of uh, ways in which we are working with our students um, to become more confident learners. We know that um, when students feel good and confident and joyful and challenged, they are more likely to come to school. They are more likely to um, not engage in poor behaviors. And we know that there are just um, strengthened uh, feelings of overall positive well being. So we continue to focus um, again, attention and um, time and attention to these very important areas. Uh, thanks, Joe. Next slide. Uh, for staff uh, by staff wellness offerings, there were eight different offerings, um, including a few that unfortunately were not able to run as they were to begin um, the week that we um, left school. Uh, but I'm very grateful uh, to those staff who offered um, Zumba classes, yoga, strength and conditioning. Uh, the classes, the idea was created this year to support staff in efforts for improved self-care. And um, we had classes run over these past uh, 10 weeks. Two staff members came, came forward and sent me uh, emails in late March and early April saying, I, I just really want to uh, involve, invite people to um, 
you know, practice wellness and um, very grateful to them. You can see in this slide, this is a Pilates um, Zoom uh, or rather Google form. We had 63 people uh, participating across the district in this class taught by Katie Monopoly, paraprofessional at Parker Road Preschool at Wesleyan Terrace. Um, Katie's also an extended school care provider at Cooley School. So thank you so much uh, for the to the staff for doing that. Additionally, I mean, so many, it's hard to capture in one presentation all of the wonderful things going on, but we also had CrossFit here in Shrewsbury and Get in Shape for Women um, provide CrossFit free memberships to a few of our students in need along with their parents. Uh, and those membership, memberships um, were really just so appreciated. We also had Get in Shape for Women as just one other example. They came in and offered several classes to um, a couple dozen Sherwood Middle School students after school and we're grateful to them again for um, their generosity. Next slide, please, Joe. Here we have a picture of some um, seniors, uh, seniors versus seniors trivia competition. And thanks to the Shrewsbury Public Library and specifically Annie King, uh, who created the trivia game for this event. Pictured here is Shrewsbury High School Assistant Principal Maureen Monopoly with an intergenerational team of uh, trivia players, Shrewsbury High School seniors and seniors who um, frequent the senior center. Plenty of connections and conversations made for an energizing event. And this was just one of a few events that took place uh, thanks to the work of Ellen Dolan and Priya and a number of people at the Shrewsbury Public Library um, were grateful to Kelly Landini and the residents at Orchard Grove who uh, provided a wonderful uh, brunch for the Young at Heart Chorus. They uh, put on a free concert during um, in the fall for all members of our, of our community and our students served them brunch and um, the whole pro reading project was a, a tremendous success and um, I'm grateful to all of those wonderful people. Next slide, please, Joe. So communicating with the community in a variety of ways is something that I have worked to do, um, to worked to have accomplished over the past several months. Uh, my, my favorite communications meetings are those in-person meetings where I have the opportunity to meet with people one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. Um, I've had the opportunity to uh, share with the Rotary Club and the Shrewsbury Men's Club and a number of organizations just um, regarding my work and our work that we're seeking to accomplish across the district. Um, last summer, I had the pleasure of participating in over 40 one-on-one -on -one conversations with a variety of community members. Um, some I invited in, others asked to come in and speak with me and share um, their ideas and, and whatnot. And I cannot thank um, the, those 40 people along with the several um, individuals and teams of people with whom I've met this year uh, for sharing ideas, questions and wisdom with me. Here on this slide is a picture of one of my S'more um, newsletters. I also uh, seek to um, strengthen and uh, stretch communication through the uh, community bulletin and through Twitter. And we have a new alumni group of the Shrewsbury Public Schools, Shrewsbury Schools community on LinkedIn. So I encourage uh, those of you who aren't LinkedIn to please do so and spread the word. <laughs> Thank you. And next slide. Celebrating community efforts is another favorite task um, of mine. On this slide pictured on the left, you see a, a photograph of Dean Park uh, Pizza sign. Um, as, as you know already, Dean Park Pizza employees donated $1,000 to our, our schools just a couple of months ago. Um, they 
gave all of their tips over the course of several days um, to our schools to be used um, for COVID relief um, funds and for families in need. Uh, pictured on the right here, um, we have a student at the high school who um, set up a free toilet paper stand in his neighborhood and um, SHS alum Gina Sheehan took a picture of it and sent it my way. Um, so we thank Hassan for his generosity um, back on March 17th and to Gina for, for sharing a bright spot um, with us. And again, I really love to um, spread or celebrate the kindnesses that are shared across across our community and I will continue to do so. Next slide, please. Um, so in closing, I just wanna thank the students, staff, families, alumni and community partners for all of your support. Um, and I continue, I, and I will continue to ask um, for, for help and help in the way of, uh, you've listened to Kevin and Mary tonight share ways in which they've um, dedicated time and energy to our students and our staff. I, um, I seek help from the community um, as far as funds go. Um, if you find that you are someone who has uh, $2 or $20 to give to our schools, um, right now is the time. Um, and we're just grateful for every donation, again, of, of time, talent, expertise, and funding. And um, I am, again, just very grateful to have had the opportunity to serve the district in this role. And again, I look forward to um, continuing a few of the um, projects that we've had going on this year while I focus my attention primarily on the Patton School community. I attended my first PTO meeting last night, which was a, a lot of fun, um, wonderful people, again, seeking to um, do whatever they can for students and staff and one another. And um, that's just terrific. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over for questions, comments. Thank you, Dr. Lusat. Any questions or comments from the committee? I'm not seeing any listening in. Jason? Just a comment. I want to thank Dr. Lazat for this work. And, you know, it, it, of course, this conversation ties back to our budget situation. I lament that Shrewsbury is, is as dependent as it is on non traditional sources of revenue. And this is a conversation we had a few weeks ago when we were talking about fees. Um, certainly, I wish. Uh, even in a pre-COVID world, our district were more financially secure than it is. But uh, in light of the Shrewsbury situation that existed before COVID and in light of the COVID situation, I just want to express that I'm, I'm pleased that we uh, had the focus on drumming up these additional financial resources. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Lazad and her team for their work in generating them. Uh, I truly wish that they were able to be a little bit more extra than they are, but uh, every dollar is going to go a long way right now. So kudos. Thanks, Jason. John? Yeah, just uh, really appreciate uh, the work and coordination that Dr. Lazat uh, you know, showed in this uh, first year of this role. Uh, you know, I know in addition to some of the you know, great uh, progress we've seen in you know, cash donations and the, uh, the in-kind services, uh, upwards of about $240,000, um, you know, just uh, incorporating the businesses into the classroom, even the town leadership, something like that, bringing town government into the class uh, to expose students to something maybe otherwise they wouldn't be exposed to, uh, as Kevin was talking about the Edgemere Development Project. Um, you know, and just also, you know, connecting with alumni, I think really that first presentation we had uh, during the kind of the kickoff week um, uh, with the alumni and current students telling us and sharing their experiences in Shrewsbury Public Schools, I thought it was really impactful, uh, something I know I've carried with me throughout the school year, uh, you know, providing examples of, you know, students taking different paths, uh, and just really thought it was uh, really well done. So thank you so much uh, for all the work you've done in this role. You're welcome. Dale, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I just a uh, good presentation and uh, thank you for all that you've done for us. I'm really interested in your developing the alumni network and I wonder how successful you've been. And uh, I see that you've called upon them to give some guidance to students. 
have has there been any thought also about surveying uh, the alumni uh, with regard to their experience in Shrewsbury High and uh, what things were you know we could improve on? Yeah, so um, Kathleen and Michelle have spent have spent a lot of time gathering addresses of alumni, um, including uh, home addresses, email addresses. The postcard effort um, resulted in a few hundred, maybe upwards of four or five hundred alum giving us, providing us with their information, um, not just information, contact information, how I, I would like to get involved with the schools. I'd like, I'm able to give a financial donation. I'm available to visit classrooms to speak about my work. Um, so we have, we are generating that information and we have sent um, ways in which they can get involved and contacted a few people specifically. The alumni mentoring program came about as a result of all of the alumni who contacted us after receiving the postcard and we then sent an ask. So those people who offered to share their work in computer science or share their work in venture capitalism. Those were the, they were the facilitators of these group meetings and that is the work that we seek to continue. So we're making, I would say, a strong progress as far as um, finding people, but there's work to be had where we're missing some classes of alum, yes. Uh, uh, with regard to what worked and what didn't work with regard to their education, you know, if they had some advice to give the school yeah. as to what things uh, they felt were particularly helpful or what they could have used or what they took that didn't help them at all. Yes, and those insights came out in the meetings. Um, they were shared in the meetings that we had in April. Um, and But we need to continue that work in a more, um, just in different ways. So that is on our, the top of our to-do list. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Lindsay, are you all set? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I was debating, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I'm wondering if some of the, well, I believe Dr. Sawyer mentioned earlier in the meeting, the attempts to reach out to relatively recent alumni um, to get their perspective, particularly, particularly alumni of color, to ask about their experiences. Now, are we building off of that? I'm guessing that's coming from the work you've done and we're able to call it a little bit, uh, but, but maybe, maybe those are divergent efforts. Um, they're, they're one in the same effort. So what Dr. Sawyer and I and a team are working um, along with the high school administration to identify students. We have some students already who have um, said count me in, which is wonderful, um, but we are uh, looking to expand that group and that network. Um, so that work um, is starting and actually had started uh, a ways back. Um, so we, we're on it. We actually have a meeting tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I think that work, that work is so important as you connect with alumni and, um, um, and we learn about their experiences and we hope that having just a little bit of distance that we can get some of our honest and critical feedback, and sometimes feedback that might be difficult to hear, but that's probably the best place for us to really have that opportunity. So I, I'm, I'm glad we're, we're finding more ways, you know, beyond just finding, finding career goals for young people. There's lots of stuff you've talked about tonight that I think is really important, but, but this piece of work, we know, we know we, have, we have a lot of work to do. Absolutely, yes, we do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lasson. I think your report shows a um, broad array of things that you have laid the groundwork for. And that's really important with this role because so many things are, are part of education that aren't just classroom education. And all these pieces, including the, the Colonial Fund um, dollars, like Jason said, money that we do need to supplement the appropriated budget. And the connection with alumni, I think is important because not only for funds if somebody wants to donate, but experiences, um, what you had with the students, recent graduates talking to new 
or you know upcoming students is so so important and i think the other part with the social emotional learning you've laid that groundwork for students and teachers to have the ability to incorporate that into their daily practice um, and there, of course there's more work to do in all these fields but we do have a really solid foundation to build on so thank you very much for everything you've done it's been a busy year uh, you've had your hands in a lot of things but we're really appreciative appreciative of it so thank you yeah well dr sawyer any comments uh yes please miss fritz uh thank you dr lazat for the presentation uh, when I reflect on sort of what the expectations were for this role uh, in the outset that we had determined, I think that, uh, as was mentioned, uh, you know, some really outstanding work had been done, has been done this year, especially getting a lot of these initiatives off the ground. Um, and to break that inertia is always a challenge. I, I certainly uh, feel good that uh, for a school district that has never had a district-focused, coordinated approach to building connections with the business community, uh, both for support, but also to provide learning options for our, opportunities for our students. And I know Dr. Lazad and the Quantum Connections team were actually planning on some summer internships that were going to begin this summer that got waylaid by the pandemic, but uh, in the future, that's certainly something we're looking to extend through that project. Um, it's the first time after many years of suggestions and, and questions of what we could do, that we have some capacity to start to build that alumni network that you were just speaking about. Uh, which uh, certainly uh, there's no reason that uh, we as a, a public school district can't build the same kind of robust alumni network uh, to support us as is typically done um, in, in the private sector for education. Uh, but of course, just like private schools have, uh, we need the resources to, to make that work. Um, and Dr. Lazar brought that to the table. Um, and also in terms of generating connections with community partners in a variety of different ways. Um, not to mention the fact that Mr. Winsky referenced that uh, generating uh, almost a quarter million dollars in donations, uh, about $95,000 in pure cash donations to the district and about 140,000 plus in in-kind donations that really benefited us. Um, and just to remind everyone who's watching, um, that's at the initial investment for the school district of $0. Uh, Dr. Lazat's salary this year um, is funded entirely uh, by the uh, Colonial Connections uh, partnership we have with Shrewsbury Federal Credit Union. Uh, to whom we are indebted uh, for that partnership. Additionally, beyond that, Shrewsbury Federal Credit Union funded the entire stipends for Michelle Biscotti and Kathleen Cohen. Um, so that entire team, they each work part-time in their roles in development and volunteer coordination, um, did not cost the school district a single dollar, uh, yet yielded a quarter million dollars in benefit. Um, and that's a return on investment I think any organization would be um, more than happy to have uh, in, as far as that work. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, fi finally, just a, a reference, I know that next week, uh, the, sc the school committee will be um, holding my annual evaluation and, and uh, I surveyed the community and our staff uh, for some feedback in advance of that. And of course, these are very difficult times relative to the budget and people are considering uh, what we might look at. And I, I recognize that there were a few comments uh, with perceptions uh, that somehow the, the school district level administration had become uh, quote unquote, top heavy, um, and sometimes referencing this particular position. And, and just to want to reference that in addition to the fact that this position didn't cost a single dollar, but generated almost a quarter million dollars for the district this year, uh, it was the first addition of an administrator at the district level um, in two decades. Um, and over those two decades, obviously, um, the school district grew quite a bit uh, by literally thousands of students. Um, so as far as a district administrative team, um, that one addition at no cost uh, generated a tremendous amount of value during the past year, uh, both monetarily and also based on the many, many experiences that were just described in the report. Um, so I thank Dr. Lazat for her work, along with the her team that she's worked with, all the volunteers that she connected with. Um, I, I do believe it's, it's laid an excellent groundwork. I'm disappointed, of course, that the fact that due to our financial situation, uh, Dr. Lazat will have to hit pause on many of these things or will move them forward incrementally. Uh, while she focuses her time as the acting principal at Patton, with the hope that uh, we'll be able to continue to resume this work uh, in more full uh, follow fashion uh, after that as things uh, change over the next uh, year plus, hopefully uh, for the better relative to our financial situation. But I wanted to make sure the community was aware of those facts. Uh, I wanna mm -hmm. thank the school committee for supporting this um, and taking a risk uh, a year ago to uh, uh, enter this partnership that allowed this to happen. Um, and most importantly, thank Dr. Wazat for her uh, many efforts over the past year. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, uh, Mr. Collins will provide a report to the committee regarding the school department's release of use of the Beale Early Childhood Center building and land. I, I can I can start with that, uh, Ms. Fritz, okay. as well, uh, if that's okay. Uh, let me just get to my page here. Uh, this is more of a, a preview of a vote that uh, I'll be requesting the school committee take next week at actually at Mr. Mizakar's request as well. Uh, we have uh, uh, over time since the new build school building project came into view as a potential project. Um, the question, of course, arose is what the town would do with the existing deal school and that property uh, once the new school was built and we move into it and begin to utilize that. Uh, from the get-go, my recommendation, and I know the school committee has concurred, um, is that uh, the school department will not have any use uh, any longer for that uh, building uh, that's coming to the end of its useful life, uh, certainly in, in terms of an educational capacity, uh, nor, the, nor that property. Uh, but uh, in a number of years ago, when Dr. McGee was chair, and in your packet, there's a letter that was sent to the Board of Selectmen, um, and Mr. Topalo in particular, uh, for the Beal Reuse Committee that was established, um, signaling that the school department uh, intended to, but that of course they weren't able to bind a future school committee uh, given that the project was in such an early stage at that point. I'm not even sure if it had been approved yet uh, by the voters, maybe it just had been. Uh, at this point, uh, the town is getting ready to move forward. They've done more work uh, relative to um, the repurposing of that uh, uh, resource and land uh, in the center of town. Um, and uh, this will be the first next week in a sequence of, of uh, votes uh, first, the school committee, uh, which will be recommended to vote next week, um, that contingent upon uh, us vacating the property when the new school is ready and open, um, that it would be turned back to the town. Uh, subsequently, the Board of Selectmen will take a vote, uh, essentially, and I'm not sure what the exact terminology is, but essentially labeling that uh, uh, as, as uh, surplus. Um, and then later on, when town meeting does convene later this summer, the town meeting is going to be asked to vote to um, allow the town to uh, sell the property. And I know that the Bill Reuse Committee and Selectmen have been working on a, uh, an RFP um, relative to the kinds of uh, development or use uh, that they would like to see uh, for that parcel of land in the center of town. Um, so with that, I know uh, Mr. Mizakar actually uh, forwarded to me, it was too late to go into your packet, uh, but the town council has uh, uh, created a, uh, a motion for next week uh, that essentially has a lot of language about the, the deed and where it is and of course the registry of deeds uh, but that again, uh, the vote that it will no longer be necessary for school purposes, uh, contingent um, on the new Beale early, uh, new Beale school opening on Lake Street, um, and us moving into that for occupancy, um, and then declare that it's no longer uh, going to be used by the school department after that time. Um, so that'll be an important step in the work that will be happening uh, to move that forward. Um, and uh, in advance of uh, that vote next week. I uh, wanted to see if the school committee had any questions or comments uh, at this point. Anyone have any questions or comments? No. Again, we'll be voting on that next week. So, all right, all set, thank you. Okay, next on the agenda under finance and operations, uh, due to the magnitude of the budget cap that we're facing for the next uh, school year, Dr. Sawyer and Mr. Collins will provide a, their recommendation around the fiscal year 2021 compensation for non-union represented staff. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Fritz. I'm gonna share my screen here in a minute. Uh, just to show you a couple of uh, slides relative to this topic. And hopefully everybody can see that information there. Um, Okay, so first is um, more specific information relative to the non-union uh, employee groups uh, and budget uh, resources uh, for fiscal 21. Uh, again, for general context, uh, you might recall that on the May 27th meeting, um, when we provided uh, kind of an overall financial uh, update relative to the fiscal 21 budget, uh, I talked uh, specific, specifically about uh, how we might try to navigate uh, the situation financially uh, going into fiscal 21 in that because um, we had already presented 
um, a $1.7 million budget reduction plan from Dr. Sori's original budget uh, that many of the places that one might normally go to uh, trim the budget had already been um, done. So for example, uh, curriculum supplies, uh, a variety of uh, various uh, positions totaling 28.6 FTE, uh, the elimination of uh, foreign language at Sherwood Middle School, uh, a grade five team, uh, a grade three teacher at Floral Street School, several of the teachers that uh, were talking uh, this evening or presented this evening as retirements, not backfilling those positions. So all of those things are already on the table. And that in addition to that, uh, that what we were estimating uh, and still estimating is a gap of anywhere between 4.2 and uh, $4.8 million uh, going forward as a result of uh, reduced revenue overall for the town but then also new COVID related expenditures. So um, I just kind of referenced the pie chart and, and said, you know, where is, where's the place to go? Where is the money in order to try to uh, help make some movement towards that? And of course it's in payroll. We're an organization like every other school district uh, where, you know, 83 to 85% of our budget pie is allocated toward uh, staff salaries and wages. So uh, tonight is the more formal recommendation uh, um, that the all administrators compensation for the upcoming year uh, be frozen. Um, that also uh, has been uh, discussed by Dr. Sawyer uh, and just even tonight uh, having Dr. Uh, Lazat serve as the acting principal at uh, Patton School with Mrs. Bell's departure. Uh, and that would save us um, just about $120,000 uh, next year. And then also, uh, freezing the compensation for all non-union staff. Um, and that would save us uh, just over $60,000. Um, so a little bit more uh, granular look at this. Uh, in this chart here, you can see uh, the administration group, a headcount of 15 people, uh, a total uh, payroll associated for uh, those salaries for next fiscal year, just over $2.1 million. And again, if salaries were frozen, that would save us uh, just over $47,000. The non-union staff, uh, which includes all clerical support staff, IT staff, um, other miscellaneous non-represented employees, uh, 64 uh, individuals, uh, we've budgeted uh, just over $3.24 million uh, for all those uh, wages. And by freezing compensation at the current level, uh, would save us uh, just over $60,000. So just those two combined, 79 people impacted uh, and uh, budget savings of uh, just over $107,000. Uh, and then this slide just kind of adds all those various uh, components together. Um, and uh, you can see that uh, all of those three actions if the committee uh, were to decide to formally take that action this evening uh, would save us uh, $227,260. Uh, so we're trying to reach in every place possible uh, to make progress towards more certainty around uh, navigating through fiscal 21. In addition uh, to that and separately from that is the extended school care program, which uh, you all know is a self-funded uh, enterprise program, if you will, and that those tuitions paid cover all of those uh, salaries and wages uh, along with uh, their benefit costs and supplies and actually a $50,000 annual contribution towards building utility costs. Um, you know, from Mrs. Isaacson's uh, presentation in March um, in uh, your vote to set those uh, rates for uh, next school year was also implicit in that was a 1.5% wage increase for all of that staff. Uh, again, we're recommending that uh, all of those salaries and wages uh, be frozen and uh, that would save that program uh, just over $33,000 uh, as well. So uh, at this point, uh, you know, the, the recommendation is to uh, uh, take this action uh, this evening. Um, and what we're, what, you know, we're trying to walk through here uh, is bringing a little bit more certainty to, the, to those items that we can um, and uh, certainly waiting for the state budget process to unfold so we can see and understand uh, what kind of state aid 
uh, would be uh, afforded to uh, Shrewsbury in both Chapter 70 and the Special Education Circuit Breaker Program. And then the third big component in terms of trying to uh, actually complete a budget uh, for next uh, fiscal year would be um, receiving more specific guidance from the Department of Education around what school uh, reopening will look like and what conditions must be met. It's really hard to make uh, uh, estimates around uh, staff costs and all other related costs and staffing levels uh, until we know the conditions under which we're going to reopen schools. And if it is uh, certain conditions or constraints such as uh, limitations on the number of children uh, in a classroom at any one particular time, uh, that's going to be uh, very likely more costly to present that educational program. Uh, and there's lots of concern uh, across the nation and across the state uh, about the additional costs related to reopening schools under very different conditions. Uh, so those are the things that uh, will we'll yet to uh, uh, occur and we're waiting for. Um, uh, but this is something that is within the positive control in terms of the non-union uh, salaries and wages. And we think it's important to uh, take control of that and bring certainty to those areas that we can at this particular time. So that's what we have uh, this evening. And I'll turn it over to uh, back to you, Mrs. Fritz or, or Dr. Sawyer, who might have some additional comments. If just briefly, uh, thank you, Mr. Collins. And, uh, you know, it's certainly... I'm truly sorry, and it's with regret that I do make this recommendation uh, that our non-represented staff uh, not receive any pay increase next year and that their compensation is frozen at this year's level. Um, essentially, of course, that has nothing to do with the quality of their work or how hard they're working. Um, it has to do with this uh, budget gap of, of uh, very large magnitude uh, that we need to uh, address. and. Uh, I don't really see where uh, I could make a recommendation other than trying to avoid or partially offset uh, some additional layoffs or, or furloughs that we might have to utilize, uh, depending on the amount of money, obviously, that's available to us. Uh, so again, it, it is certainly a recommendation I, I don't like making, uh, but under the circumstances, I feel that it is uh, the most responsible one to make uh, in the interest of trying to preserve our program and, and working conditions to the great ex extent that we can. And with that, we're happy to answer any questions from the committee. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments before we vote? Pat, can you take the slide presentation down? Sure. Uh, Madam Chair. Sure. Um, I certainly want to just um, appreciate the entire senior leadership team and the district leadership team. Um, every every week we have a new a new Excel spreadsheet of where are the places that we're going to to trim, uh, and um, the, that is. That is not that is not the reason you be you became educators, <laughs> uh, but it is it is the mission we're on right now. Uh, and I know obviously none of us want to be in this position. I am in support at this point in time, and as Dr. Sawyer said, not because I don't think these people are doing wonderful work, but because we know at the end of the day that we are probably going to have to be making some staffing cuts, and any dollar that we can save um, and and mitigate that uh, and and ensure the quality education for our students in the future is going to be I think it's the proper choice for us, um, but it is a really un unfortunate time that we, we find ourselves in. But I just want to acknowledge all of the work that goes into every one of these as we calculate amongst a sea of uncertainty <laughs> and try to find some little little bits to hold on to. So thank you for all of all of the effort on, your, on, on our behalf. Thank you, Lindsay. Anyone else have any comments or questions? I'm not seeing any. Um, I too support it and it's reluctantly because like Lindsay said, we know the people in our district worked extremely hard, um, probably more so through this pandemic than um, we even wanted them to because there's just been so many issues that we've had to deal with that we haven't in the past. So now to ask for a um, compensation freeze is difficult, but we do need to look to that future. And if we can mitigate this gap, and have some certainty as we formulate the FY21 budget, that will help us with our planning. Um, so it's, it's an unfortunate fallout of what we're all dealing with. Okay, nothing further from the group. So may I have a motion that the committee vote that the compensation of all non-union staff for fiscal year 2021 be frozen at the level as of June 30th, 2020. So moved. 
Second. Roll call vote is required. Lindsay? Aye. Dale? Aye. Jason? Aye. John? Aye. Myself? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have our minutes from the school committee meeting held on June 3rd, 2020. Are there any changes or corrections? I'm not seeing any, so they can be marked as accepted as distributed. Uh, we do need to go into executive session this evening for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law Chapter 30A, Section 21A7 to comply with or act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant in aid requirements, Purpose 7, Open Meeting Law, Gen Open Meeting Law, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 22FG, for the purpose of reviewing, approving, and or releasing executive session minutes, and B, for the purpose of addressing Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 30A, 21A3, to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect of the bargaining or litigating position of the public body. And the chair so declares purpose three, the Shrewsbury Education Association Unit A, Shrewsbury Education Association Unit B, the Shrewsbury Paraprofessional Association, and or the Shrewsbury Cafeteria Workers, where deliberation in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and we will return to open session only for the purpose of adjourning for the evening. I have a motion that we adjourn to executive session. So moved. So moved. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote. Lindsay? Aye. Dale? Aye. Jason? Aye. John? Aye. Myself? Aye. Thank you and good night.